Yo, and welcome to the 148th episode of Lake of Rage Pokemon Trading Card Game Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Kevin Clementi, aka Mellow underscore Magikarp. I'm joined today by three very special temporary guest hosts who are going to help us get ready for the Indianapolis Regional Championships, which is looking like it should be the largest regional championships ever yet again. First one we have is Colin Murley Matthews. Colin, give us some of those accomplishments. I know I mispronounced it, didn't I? <laughs> It's it, not, you're good. Trust me. It's okay. <laughs> it's a struggle bus of my entire life. It's okay. Um, some of my top accomplishments recently got top eight at Vancouver, uh, top four at Pittsburgh earlier this season, top 16 this season as well at uh, Peoria, top 16 last season at Toronto. Uh, all, all Mew, of course, the Mew man himself. Yeah, I was kind of hesitant of like, do you know anything besides Mew? How are you doing post rotation? Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a little difficult, but we're we're going through there. We've been playing a lot of Chen Pao, and that deck's really fun. That deck's awesome. Next up, we have CJ Rodriguez. CJ, share your accomplishments, and I think it'll be very obvious to listeners why I invited you on when you share what it is. <laughs> uh, I have a top 56 at Orlando Regionals, the biggest regional so far, with Espathra Bennett. Uh, that's really my only major accomplishment, though I've won a couple of uh, cups this season, so looking to get a, another big win at Indianapolis. We are here to give the Espathra propaganda to people. I love that deck. <laughs> <laughs> Caleb Rogerson is our third guest, joining us for the second time. Caleb, what are some of your accomplishments that you have so far? Thank you. My biggest accomplishment recently is second place at Charlotte Regionals, and just at Orlando Regionals a couple weeks back, I got top 32, both with Charizard. Charizard's broken. <laughs> and I think that's going to be something we're going to talk about a fair amount. And let's go ahead and start with the first thing, the thing that everyone is asking themselves going into a tournament. What are the most expected decks we are going to see? Let's go ahead and go with the top three to five if you think that, you know, number four and five are going to be close to number three in there. Colin, we're going to go ahead and start with you. What are the top three to five most expected decks going into indie for you? So, number one is uh, Big Bad Lizard, uh, Mr. Charizard, uh, of course, number one. Um, and I think Sea Pals is still follow right behind it. Looking at even Orlando numbers, it was like right behind it. Uh, I think Lost Tina is going to be pretty pretty expected a little bit, I'm not going to lie. And then maybe I would say Arc for Arc and like Ancient Box for four and five. Now, I got to press you. When you say Arceus, are you talking about Arc Tina or are you just thinking Arc Piles in general? So I think Arc Piles in general, I think Artina is a solid deck as well. Um, I think the Arc Control deck is actually really cool. And I think that's a nice, like the Arc Control, whatever the, the Sao Paulo list was, the top 16 list. I thought that, mm -hmm. I think that deck's pretty interesting as well. So I think that deck's like not too shabby on its own. And CJ, what about you? What are some of those most expected decks? Absolutely. Number one, big battle of the format, Charizard. Uh, number two, I actually want to say that Austina is going to pop up a little bit more. Uh, it seems to have a pretty good matchup into all these rogue decks that are popping up uh, to beat Charizard. Uh, but I actually want to go against the record and say that number three is probably going to be a Spathra, similar to what we saw at Sao Paulo. Uh, it's got a pretty good matchup into Shen Pao, Tina, and Charizard, as long as you know how to play it. Uh, but I do expect it to be up there. If not, number three, number four with uh, Shen Pao. Yeah, but I do think that number five is going to go to Ancient Box. We definitely can't sleep on the fact that at Sao Paulo, we had uh, Gabriel Semedo and Vinny Fernandez, who are two of the top deck builders and players in the world playing a spath or is definitely like a hmm this is a this is interesting right very very true very true kayla what about you those most expected decks of course charizard number one probably two times as popular as the second most played deck which i think is Gen pao and i also think ancient will be close if you combine ancient and just roaring moon dunsparce then that will possibly be second even but those are two kind of different decks, so I don't know if I would combine them. I would say Charizard, Shen Pao, then Ancient Box, and then Lost Tina pretty close. And I guess depending on where you put Arceus at, if you were to group all the Arceus decks, that would maybe be like a top three, top four deck. But then if just Arceus, Tina, I would put that at five even. I'm glad you kind of mentioned when you put Ancient Box and Moon together that they are different decks, because I was going to ask. Can you really lump those two together? So I kind of want to press you a little bit, and then I'll let everyone else kind of jump into that. How similar are these two decks? Are most people kind of like, well, they're both big beat stick basics, and so we can lump them together because they play the same, or they have like vastly different matchup spreads in your opinion, Caleb? 
I feel like their matchup spreads are pretty similar. I think I prefer the Ancient Box deck, although I haven't really played much with either of them. I played a little bit of the Ring the Dunsparce deck before EYC because some of my friends thought the deck was good and then the deck just kept losing to Charizard over and over again. <laughs> and I think that both of the decks kind of have that same problem that the Charizard matchup isn't particularly great. I do think that the Dunsparce version is interesting in the fact that if Charizard isn't playing Mist Energy, then you have more of a one-shot prize trade, which I think is a little bit better for you, but a lot of them are playing Mist Energy, so then at that point you'd have to find like a Temple of Sinnoh or Mawile, and that just makes you struggle even more with the Dunsparce kind of being, I think it's more of a, I guess, a disguise is the deck as consistent, as more consistent than the Ancient Box deck, when I think the Ancient Box deck, you just like, you're more consistent at getting your Ancient cards in the discard faster, and you're actually doing more damage quickly, which is better, in my opinion, than having the Dunsparce as a stable draw engine late. Colin, do you have any thoughts on comparing the two, or are you kind of lumping them together? Uh, I think they are, like, two more separate decks. I, I think I agree with that. Like, the Dunsparce, like, you do have the, the nice one-shot on Charizard or any other big, <clears throat> excuse me, other big attackers, and, like, I think it just plays a little differently. Because, like, regular Angel Box, you're trying to turbo through your deck and be like, I have five cards left in my deck turn two. That's sick. Of all these ancients, let this card pile actually hit big numbers. So, and CJ, how about you for uh, Angel Box versus Moon? I do think that Moon is more favored into the meta, uh, especially with the one hit KO potential of uh, Roaring Moon EX. But I do think they are very different decks with uh, Roaring Moon going for more of a slow and steady ap approach uh, with the one hit KO potential. Whereas, again, as Colin said, Angel Box just kind of turns through the deck and gets those big numbers really early. Got it. So it seems like we're three for three on the, hey, you should probably test against both of them and don't assume you know what you're doing if you know one of them. Let's go ahead and jump back to Charizard, though, because I promised you all in the pregame, we're going to talk a fair amount about some of the Charizard stuff. We all said it was number one. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone. If it is a surprise, you got some homework to do before Indy this weekend. But let's say the percentage. So it's going to be a very simple yes or no. Will Charizard be 25% or greater of the day one meta share. So one quarter of decks. We'll go ahead and we'll go same order, Colin, CJ, and Caleb. So, oh my gosh, you all have seats. Anyway, <laughs> Colin. That was intentional. It was intentional. That's clearly <laughs> Colin. Greater than 25%, yes or no? Uh, I don't know about greater than 25%. I think it would probably be close to 25, 22 to 25%, probably. I think that's pretty fair. CJ, greater than, less than? I think it's going to be a little bit less than. I do agree that uh, with Colin that it's probably going to be around 23, 25. Just uh, a lot of other decks that are trying to pop up too. And Caleb? I think it should be greater than 25%. <laughs> and I'm going to say that it will barely be greater than 25%. Awesome. So it sounds like we're all in that same ish percentage. Maybe 25 is actually the perfect number to pick. And then the lists, specifically the A spec of choice of most of the lists or most of the successful lists. You can go either way you want. So we saw in Brazil, the Heroes Cape winning. We, of course, saw Prime Catcher winning everything else. And then Maximum Belt was the hype one before, you know, everything else. We'll go same order. Colin, which one? And none, none of the three of you don't say, oh, it'll be equal or it depends. No, 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 no. That's not what we're here for. Which ones do you think will be more played and or more successful of the three? Um, I would say I think the Prime Catcher is going to be more played just because of how much more success it has been in recent tournaments. Um, I think so. I think that's going to be more successful or more seen. However, I would say be prepared for a hero escape and have an idea what's going on. I'd be prepared for that. CJ, what about you? I actually want to go against the grain and say that Maximum Belt is going to be the most played in Charizard uh, because of the Shen Pao ticking up and uh, other decks like Espathro popping up, you want to take those big one-hit KOs early. So going uh, turn one or turn two, after you evolve and knocking out a Shen Pao in the active, is way more impactful than just tanking damage and making them burn resources. And Kayla, what are you thinking of the three? I think based on recent success and also just like random online tournaments, that Prime Catcher will be the most played for sure, and then I think it'll be the most successful just because it'll be the most played. But also, I think it's the worst out of the three. <laughs> that is a hot take. Wait a minute. How? 
would you say it's the worst one? The Tord Reckliff played it. Isn't that all you need? That's what Liam said. Well, I think it's pretty good. Like, I think it's barely worse than the other two. I just think right now, with Charizard being the most played deck and the most, like, focus of everyone, I think that Tord's mentality of just, like, having a neutrally good deck into everything is a little bit weaker than having something to tech for either the mirror or your other matchups, which Max Bell is mainly for the mirror, obviously hits uh, like this, Bathra and the Chen Pao also, but it's the best in the mirror match. And then Hero's Cape is the best in the non-mirror match. Anything that's not mirror, basically, it'll help you out a little bit. Those will be your matchups like Lost Tina, Arceus, that might be a little more sketchy that Prime Catcher just like is neutral against. The next one that I want for each of you, and again, no explanation necessary unless you would like to, Mist Energy. So Mist Energy was one that pre-EYC we saw in a lot of the successful lists in online tournaments, and then suddenly at EYC, eh, it did show up a little bit, but obviously the first place list didn't play it, and then suddenly Pedro again played the Mist Energy at Sao Paulo. Are you expecting Mist Energy in most Charizard lists? We'll start again, say Mortar Colin. Um, I would probably say because like that's I think people are gonna play it. Like, they're gonna be scared of Tina and they're gonna be scared of Ruin Moon X. I think that's gonna be a, a fair amount. will still be playing a Miss Energy in their list. CJ, Miss Energy. I do think that Zard should be playing Miss Energy again for the Roaring Moon. Uh, I also think because I am predicting Tina in second place, I think that they need some sort of counter to Lost Requiem, uh, and that's actually why I played a uh, Temple of Sinnoh in my Roaring Moon deck that I played yesterday at a Cup win. And Caleb, are you expecting a lot of mist? I think if you set the bar at 50%, mist energy will be under 50% of Charizard list. Awesome. And then the last Charizard question that I have is going to be about the Devo counts. Kind of goes off the mist energy, right? Mist energy stops TM Devo, so it seems pretty good. Pedro played two TM Devos in that list. Tord played zero. So uh, there's a lot of in-betweens there, right? So again, since we're on Charizard, we'll stick with the same order. Colin, how many Devos would you expect from people? Are we going to see zero? Are we going to see one? Are we going to see two? And again, don't say, oh, it depends. <laughs> oh, it depends. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, w- I, w- I would probably, I would be- say between zero and one. I think one, is like, I think you can get a point across, especially when it ca- depends on what kind of other text you play into Charizard. Like, if you want to go back to, like, the controls are where you play in the Lucky and stuff like that, you just need, like, really the one when you think about it like that. Um, so you can reuse it. So I think at least, I think at least one. I would expect, going into the weekend, I would expect at least one in the deck. I would expect at least one. CJ. I think there's going to be an uptick of two. Uh, mainly to counter Pidra control uh, as well as the mirror match. It just kind of nail- puts the nail in the coffin for the mirror match. If you play two of them, they can't ever double candy twice. And Caleb. I'm expecting my opponents to play Devo, and I think either the Regilecki or the second Devo, the second Devo being more popular, I'm going to be playing as if my opponent has access to a second TM Devolution. And then last question related to Charizard still. So we all predicted anywhere from, this is, look, there's a lot of Charizard out there. That's okay. <laughs> You're good. Uh, for those who don't know, right before I asked everyone to say their least favorite deck to play against of all time, and Colin very quickly <laughs> explained Charizard is his least favorite. But uh, are, would you, if I could hand you a hypothetical deck, that has a good Charizard matchup, not great against everything else, or a good everything else matchup and not great into Charizard, which would you pick between the two? Colin, start us off. Would you, are you more worried about Charizard or are you more worried about the field, the other 70 something percent? Um, I would, I would probably like want to be prepared for the entire field. However, not entire field, but majority of the field, or at least the top three to four decks. Um, I would still want to have a favorable Charizard matchup, though. I'd want a favorable Charizard matchup, or at least close to fifty-fifty. I wouldn't want to take a, a less than that for Charizard, especially if it's going to be like twenty to twenty-five percent or more of the field. Then I don't want to. If I hit like five Zards and I have a terrible Zard matchup, I don't want to lose because I hit five Zards. CJ, what about you? More worried about Zard or the field? I want to put a middle of the road answer here and say that the field is going to be countering Charizard, but uh, I think having an unfair with Charizard matchup is just a death sentence in this meta right now. It is the tier one deck, undisputed, 
I think we all agree on that. And I think if you take a bad matchup to it, you shouldn't play it. And Caleb, what about you? Yeah, I think I would take the favorable Charizard matchup just because I think Charizard's so important. And I think it's also just the strongest deck. So even if I have slightly unfavored matchups into other decks, the decks are not as strong and I can beat those matchups just by outskilling my opponent or just like having a deck that can actually draw cards and do something like Charizard. This podcast is sponsored by Tabletop Village. Now you might be saying, all right, Mela, we've heard you talk Tabletop Village's praises before. We get it, but it's more than just, hey, if you use code Mello5 at tabletopvillage.com, you help support the podcast. Tabletop Village is truly something that I love and that I want everyone who can support to support. It is the best local game store I have ever seen. They are Pokemon first. It is family owned and operated. And they are more than just selling cards. They are building a community. Anyone in the Washington area definitely should be familiar with this. And if you live in Western Washington and you've not been to Tabletop Village, you have to 10 out of 10. If you're here for vacation, definitely a place to stop at. Again, it is family owned and operated. The owner, Brian Myers, is one of the nicest people in the community. Someone that you should definitely get to know if you get the chance. And if you are looking for cards, it's not just Pokemon cards, but they do also have some things like Lorcana and One Piece they've been getting into more and more. They have sleeves and deck boxes and all that other good stuff. So if you need any of that and you want to support a low, no, it's maybe not local for you, local for me, but a small family owned business and help support the podcast, use code Mellow5 for 5% off your order. Anyway, let's get back to the show. This podcast is sponsored by TC Evolutions. TC Evolutions has the best damage counters, ability use markers, and now they have the best sleeves as well, featuring the dual spec sleeves. You can use code LAKE10 for 10% off sleeves, damage counters, ability use markers, status condition markers, anything. Be sure to check out tcevolutions.com and use code LAKE10 for 10% off. Anyway, let's get back to the show. We'll go and move away from Charizard, although it might creep back in occasionally over these next few decks, and talk about the one that, in general, was the next number two, was Qian Pao from you all. So, CJ, why don't you go and start us off on Qian Pao? Are you thinking about this deck as, like, it's a solid play, or only the Qian Pao heads should be playing it? Like, what do you think about Qian Pao moving into this weekend? The argument online is that if you don't know how to sequence properly with Qian Pao, it's kind of a break in your hands. Uh, but I do think that even unskilled players can have a pretty favorable time with Qian Pao into most of the other meta. I mean, most people know, you know, uh, Prime Catcher into Counseling Clone into Manaphy is a pretty good play. Uh, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to do that. But you should be a little bit more careful if you're playing into uh, more control decks. Control Zard is a little bit scary uh, because they play that eerie and they can always recycle it. It's it's pretty scary getting rid of uh, your superior energy retrievals in the late game. And I guess another question that I'll have for you, CJ, based off of that, but everyone else can add to it, too. So you mentioned the Control Zard and the Eeries, and, you know, we mentioned TM Devos as both you and Caleb had mentioned two as a popular choice. Would you be playing something like the Silene that we saw, it was uh, Reagan, in the top eight list play? Like, do you want to tech against the Eeries and the things, uh, CJ? I absolutely do. Uh, in fact, in my Espatho list that I played at Orlando, I played a Silene just to recycle uh, Pow Pad and uh, uh, Prime Catcher. I think if I'd be playing Sham Pow, I'd be playing uh, Silene too, because we saw that at Sao Paulo as well. It's just a really good tech against Aerie and anything that can discard things from your hand. Caleb, what are your thoughts on Sham Pow? I think Sham is pretty good, actually. It's not a deck that I've really played with that much, and it's a deck that I hate playing against because <laughs> my opponent just goes like double the barrel, back Scalibur, Frigibac, Shin Pao, and I'm like, okay, well, I could kill one the barrel and then try to kill the next one next turn, I guess. But it just feels like if they set up well, I don't know what to do. <laughs> so it kind of sucks to play against. And I do think the deck should play Silene because whenever I play against them and they have Silene, it just feels like I can't really run them out of resources in any way. So it seems strong. And Colin, thoughts on Qian Pao? I, I've been playing Chen Pao and I really like it a lot. I think Chen Pao is a solid play. However, I do agree, if you have not been actually playing Chen Pao, I will say you probably shouldn't be playing it because it is very punishing. 
in terms of you miss sequence and don't optimally sequence your turn correctly, it is very punishing and you can just like have a brick in your hands. Um, and I will say Silene is absolutely kind of needed. As much as I don't actually like Silene as a card, it is needed because a lot of those times you hit double tails, you're like, I just wasted my whole turn on the supporter. I could have done something differently, but it is very needed, especially with Eerie uh, running rampant, especially like the Arcos playing double Eerie and then Zard playing Eerie as well. And I think you're just going to get hit by it a bunch. So Silene's needed. The next one I want to jump into was Lawson Giratina. Of course, Arctina is a deck too, but let's focus on the Lawson version. We got the leaves in there, all that other good stuff. Caleb, Lawson Giratina. Is it the real deck for this weekend, or is Tina back to being a fraud? I think Tina kind of sucks. Uh, it beats Charizard a decent amount of the time, like maybe a little over 50%. I mean, I think if I'm playing Charizard, I have probably at least a 50% shot against Lost on Tina. But the more concern I have with Tina is that your Chen Pao matchup's not good. Your like moon type matchups aren't good. Even like Gardevoir is kind of rising. That matchup I don't think is good just because they have like Fluttermane, Klefki, Mew EX. So I think that like having a slightly better Charizard matchup than Charizard and having a lot worse other matchups, I wouldn't play the deck personally. I was at a cup last weekend. I start my Bidoof in Charizard, right? And I'm up against, I want to say it was Nathan Ginsburg. It might have been Ryan. I forget which one I was up against. But I start the Bidoof and I'm like, hey, they've, I know they're Tina from a mulligan, and I'm like, I have no idea how this matchup's supposed to go. They thought I was Qian Pao. And they're like, oh, so I'll let you know. If you go first and set up, you win. And if I go, or if you go second and set up, you win. And I was like, okay, cool. So it definitely seems like the <laughs> Qian Pao Tina matchup's uh, pretty bad for the Tina. Colin, you've been playing some Qian Pao. What are your thoughts on Tina? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I think, okay, so I think Tina is good in the Zard and like, and that's pretty much like what you cared about play Tina for. Um, his Shen Pao matchup is pretty pretty bad. If they get double bib up. What do they do? What does a Tina player do? Nothing. <laughs> There's absolutely nothing. Like oh, save a lot. Like counter catcher, knock out your one bib. Okay, cool. Bib roll for four. Like after Roxanne <laughs> or bib roll for two more, whatever. However you rush your hand is. So I think Tina. But I think Tina's still like okay if you want to beat Zard. It's that deck that if you are focusing on beating Zard, you should probably play Tina. Probably one of them. All right. So we have a not great and an okay. CJ, thoughts on Loss on Tina, and is it better than not great or okay? I think it's a good pick. Uh, actually, I kind of want to walk that back a little bit. Uh, <laughs> hearing everybody else discuss it, your Ancient Fox matchup isn't as good as I thought. Uh, you can never hit anything above 200 unless you go Lost Impact, which is an incredible detriment, because then you're getting rid of your own resources. Uh, I think it still has a really good matchup in, in its Zard, so you're just hoping to hit the, the matchup uh, Roulette here. I I do think it's got a pretty favorable matchup into some of the other rogue decks, like Espathra and uh, uh, Arceus Giratina, if they don't play the, the Radiant Gardevoir. And if they do, you can just uh, start Requiem, you should be fine. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a good pick, but I don't think it's the best pick, now that we've discussed it a little bit. There's one tech card I want to talk about in Giratina, and this is after seeing Pedro Pertusi do so well with the Hero's Cape specifically but i guess we could also kind of mention a temple of Sinnoh in there as well for mist energy should there be lost vacuum in giratina and then let's also go ahead and go with temple of Sinnoh as well do you expect to see vacuum or Sinnoh, or i guess do you should you be playing te vacuum or temple in a lost zone giratina list caleb what do you think should you be playing one both of those so i'm expecting most people to play at least one of each my opinion like before your escape got a little more popular was that neither was fine but as your escape and mist energy are coming back kind of i would probably play one of each but also i haven't played much with blossom tina either it's just been charizard for me <laughs> colin what about you uh i think you should be playing at least one or the other if not probably both i think just having vacuum is very valuable in the deck in its own way it can make actual seven turn like actual mirage gate turns happen and if you really need to that turn or actually getting rid of hero escape is the main thing but and cj vacuum and or temple i think temple is definitely an include uh get around mist energy but i do think the vacuum isn't entirely necessary uh because if you get rid of the temple you can just uh store and pass to hero's cave you should be fine 
I do want to add that I think that if you're playing Charizard with the Hero's Cape, playing it on Pidgeot is very important against La Suntina because um, usually what they want to do is go after your Pidgeot immediately. And if they have to V-Star that, then they can't V-Star Charizard and you are usually only getting hit with Iron Leaves once. So that probably means one of your Charizard survives and you can actually win the game by just having a Charizard live at the very end of the game with an Iono. Yo, the hot tips coming in from Kayla. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. It really does. The Pidgeot is, without Path, the lifeblood of the deck, right? Like No Path, Charizard? Yo. <laughs> <laughs> the next one that we kind of all mentioned in there, and we did talk about it a little bit, but Ancient Box specifically, so not compared to Roaring Moon, but it seemed like all three of you were like, yeah, Ancient Box is definitely still a deck. So we're talking about the... Gabriel Fernandez, Vinny Fernandez build mostly, right? All that little jank in there. Colin, you mentioned earlier it doesn't take a good matchup into Charizard, but is it still a fine play for this weekend? And or are you worried about running into ancient box decks? Um, I think it, it's the deck if you don't mind taking like pretty fair matchups across the like otherwise. I think you should. I think ancient box is pretty solid. Um, but like I said, if you're uh... If you're not wanting to play against Charizard, if you don't want to hit Charizard, don't play that deck. Just don't do it. I, there's ways for it to do it, but I think it's just better off, like, just don't even look at it for that if you're scared of Zard. CJ, what are your thoughts on Ancient Box for this weekend? Is it a threat and or a consideration? I think it is a threat. Uh, you've got a pretty good matchup into Shampao, and you've got a pretty good matchup into uh, Lost Tina, uh, and a bunch of these other decks that are roaming around. I think it's got a pretty good shot into at least day twoing. And then, Caleb, thoughts on Ancient Box? I think Ancient Box is solid. It's I think it's going to be a pretty popular deck, so it's definitely something to be worried about. And if you're playing, like, Chen Pao, definitely play the matchup some and play, like, because I know there's angles like Greninja and Iron Hand, and sometimes people are even adding Lost Vacuum. I know uh, some of the lists in Day 2 of the most recent regional that uh, Pedro won were playing Lost Vacuum in their Chin Pals to, I guess, help against Cape and against Roaring Moons with the Ancient Tool. And I think that that is maybe something to consider if it actually does anything in that matchup. But also, it does have a bad Charizard matchup. And you can beat it. It's like, if the Charizard gets a slower setup, you definitely have ways to beat it. And then also, there's like, you could play Cabalion if you want to try to get a one-shot on a Charizard late game. You could play towards like gusting their Pidgeots or Rotoms immediately before they can Turo that up. But I think if the Charizard player gets a couple Turos off, then you kind of just lose. I want to go off the vacuum that you mentioned real quick, and any of the three of you can add to this too. But for any Ancient Box players, and then to a lesser extent Roaring Moon, because you don't hit those big numbers, uh, if you're expecting your opponent to play vacuum or you know for sure they play vacuum in their list, do not aggressively throw down those tools because that is a minus 10 damage. And that is very often, especially in the Charizard matchup, is game losing. So you might be like, oh, they can't KO me with 180. But then suddenly you're 10 damage short from hitting 330 to actually end the game with, right? So uh, be very careful off of what Caleb said. And then, Caleb, I have one specific question for you about Zard into Ancient Box because I played a cup last week. I played against a good player playing Ancient Box. And the matchup felt close. Like it's close. Okay, that was going to be my question. What can an ancient box player do to make it better for them? I think, if possible, just like kill a two prizer if you see it that you can one shot. Like if they have a Rotom down and it hasn't left play and you can one shot it, then just kill it because it's going to leave play if you don't kill it. And then even. Pidgeot, like sometimes as Charizard, you have to get the Pidgeot out of play eventually just because they can one shot it and they can't one shot anything else. So doing that is kind of beneficial. And also just like early game, if you can get aggressive knockouts on Bidu for Pidgey is good, but usually you won't be able to choose which are knocking out because you play the whatever the drum A spec instead of Prime Catcher. But if possible, with like a boss or whatever, you go like turn one, attach, turn two, attach, boss, kill the only Pidgey that could also be good. Cool. Cool. Uh, next question is about a deck none of you actually mentioned, but I want to mention it anyway because it keeps popping up and I know you're probably expecting to see people playing it. That is, of course, Lugia V Star. It won in Japan. 
it's supposed to be good, right? It has infinite damage cap, essentially, four jet energy, so bodies control. Uh, CJ, is Lugia finally going to do the thing outside of Japan, or is it still like it won that one Japanese tournament and it's done for? What are your thoughts on Lugia? So uh, my best friend actually made day two at Orlando with Lugia, so I've got some pretty good uh, backbone behind it. I think Lugia's in a fantastic spot. I just think the matchups are not there for it. Your Ancient Box matchup is kind of ugly because you have to use a Lugia. If you ever go in with a rat, you can't really trade favorably for that. You have to evolve. Uh, and if for some reason they play something like, uh, I've actually seen some lists of Ancient Box playing uh, the Iron Bundle to gust around your Lugia. If you have to feed them a, an Archaeops or a rat, you're already far behind. Uh, once they get that booster on there, if you burn a DTE, you have to attack with Lugia. Uh, but again, Lugia's in a pretty good spot. It can knock out Charizards. It can knock out a bunch of other decks. Uh, it really does good against Tina, but I don't know. Maybe it's just the consistency. Maybe, maybe we just haven't figured that out. Maybe we're in the, the pre-Ross Coffin list <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> of Lugia. Maybe we just need to fix them. Ross Cawthon playing Lugia would be just one of my absolute favorite things. That feels like the anti-Ross <laughs> deck completely. <laughs> Ross, if you're listening to this, please play Lugia. Please play Lugia. I agree. <laughs> please break Lugia like you did Moon. Because I never thought, all right, does, did any of you think he would be the person to play Roaring Moon? Also, like, <laughs> this, this, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. He would play honest. this Roaring Moon, I feel like. The one prize Roaring Moon. What if two prize Roaring Moon? Right? Like, that was... He did break it, though, so... So, waiting for someone to break it. Caleb, thoughts on... Beat him in top eight. Oh, my gosh. The brag. <laughs> <laughs> it, did, it did get him in top eight. Caleb. It's pretty good. Thoughts on the Lugia. Is it going to do something Lugia final? sucks. <laughs> uh, I mean, the deck's in a fine spot, I guess. Um, it has a fine Charizard matchup. If they play Cape, it's not even good, but if they play, like, Max Build or Prime Catcher, it's favored, I guess. Um, but there is lots of stuff they need to hit, and the deck's not very consistent. You still have a bad, like, Jin Pao matchup. You still have the bad Iron Hands matchup, which will be decently popular. Lost Box, even. But then you have some good matchups, and the deck is, like, when you get going, you do increase your win percentage by a lot. So I think it's, like, if you have only experience with Lugia and don't want to play anything else then it's a fine deck to play but i would not play it that is a bold take saying when the deck sets up you increase your win percentage <laughs> colin thoughts on lugia um if you get ultra ball double chops uh you should be chilling but i think mo but i think lugia is just mostly a pile half the time because you just cannot you just consistently just don't get there all the time and that's an issue like that's that's like lugia's main issue and plus like like yeah, your Chen Pao matchup sucks. Like your your Iron Turbo Hands matchup, that's like abysmal. Like that's unwinnable. Like what do you do? Just scoop and take an early lunch, I guess. But like, I would I would probably three not. early lunches during the same tournament. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I, I would probably not like really respect too much of the yeah, Like I I just it just it does kind of suck right now. Like, it should have all the tools we think, but it just doesn't have it. So. Control player is hyped to hear the three of you say all that. <laughs> the next one you all mentioned was Arceus. Now, of course, some of you mentioned specific Arctina versus Arc Piles. I will let you talk about whatever Arceus you want. But what are your thoughts on Arceus into this weekend? And if you think it's good and or bad, which version is good and or bad? Caleb, start us off. Thoughts on Arceus and, of course, which versions? Uh, I think Artina is not good against Charizard, so it's probably bad. Um, it's the Lost City stuff is interesting because you have like Judge Lost City for stuff like Chin Pao, also good against uh, Roy Moon Ancient Box type stuff. So I think that's okay. I think that the control version of Arceus is fine if you want to call it a control deck. But I also kind of think it might just be a worse version of Control Charizard because then you could play Charizard instead of playing Arceus. <laughs> and Charizard has more HP and it's Charizard. So you have like Pidgeot and Babarel instead of having to like Starbirth for two things and then slowly draw two cards with Babarel each turn. So I mean, I would just play Charizard, but. Arceus control seems interesting. Also, actually, Arceus Armourouge was interesting. I played against that a couple the other day, and it seemed 
okay against Charizard. So that was cool. If they don't bench Manaphy, then you have Delph Box, which is broken, but they're probably going to bench Manaphy at this point. Colin, thoughts on Arceus? Which ones are good or bad? Um, I think Arctina is like fair. The Lost City stuff is like pretty, pretty interesting. I will also agree. I think the Lost City stuff is pretty interesting. I think that disrupts like if you hit like a lot of Chen Pao, I think that's like very valid because you can just Lost City Baxes and stuff. And then what do they do? You know, um, I do, I, I think like it's matchup spread is not terrible. Like just in, like Arc, Arctina matchup spread, I don't think it's like that terrible. I think the Arc control, con, control. Whatever you want to do with that quotation, I don't know. Like you know, like I, I guess I is right. It's probably like a worse version of like Charizard control, but I do think that specific deck. I don't think is like actually that that terrible. I actually played against it at a cup yesterday, and like I had some friends talking to me about it, and they're like, this, and, like I look at it, and I'm like, this is actually not that bad of a deck. Um, and then the art, and then Charky. I'm gonna call it Charkius. That's what I've been calling it before. Um, I think that deck actually is a little more underrated than I think, but I still don't think it's as, as consistent as it could be. I think I think it could do. A little, I think it could have a little more work than doing it, maybe decent because there's a lot of options. So I think that actually really cool. And CJ, thoughts on Arceus and or the good bad ones? Arceus Vulpix is actually incredibly underplayed right now. Uh, you have a pretty good matchup into Arceus itself. You have a pretty good matchup into Charizard. You got a pretty good matchup into Spathra, uh, Lugia, Shen Pao. Like what in Shen Pao doesn't have an ability? Everything. Everything has an ability. Unless they put the Kyogre, but that's that's the tech. Nobody's playing that. It's only uh, Iron Hands. Uh, you, I, yeah, you can Iron actually, Hands. You can Iron Hands and Bundle. Like, yeah. you can use the yeah, Bundle attack like, and say you can't attack, and then, like, what do they do? That's true. So I, that's why I did to someone yesterday in my cup. Like, I did that, and they're like, oh, sick. I'm like, yeah, knock out Chimpo. <laughs> I forgot that has an attack. <laughs> I, I know, listen, everyone like... does. <laughs> everyone does. For those who don't know, the attack is uh, if your opponent's Pokemon is an evolution, it cannot attack during your opponent's next turn. (laughs) Not bad. Uh, But I did see uh, in the finals of one of the cups that I went to, there was an arc with uh, Alone Vulpix and Noivern to fix those matchups. So I think something like that would be pretty interesting to see. I was actually going to ask. Yeah, I was actually uh, practicing that deck for UIC a little bit, and I think the deck is okay. It's pretty good against Charizard if you can get it to be consistent, but I was not beating Jin Pao with it just because of, like, bundle Prime Catcher stuff. Especially if they add Silene, it's like they can Prime Catcher multiple times. They'll just, like, Prime Catcher your Vulpix immediately because they have so much draw. And then also struggling with, uh... I was also struggling with Lugia just because you don't really have a way unless you play Aerodactyl, but I do think that's probably the best one against Charizard. And then we'll have a quick roundtable of, are there any other decks that we missed? Because, of course, there are other decks in this format. So, Colin, why don't you go and start us off? Are there any other decks that you are concerned about or testing against that we have not mentioned so far? Um, I haven't personally played really any games into it, but I do think, like, it probably should think about control a little bit. Like, I don't think many, I don't think the control population is going to be very high, but if you do hit it, I think you should, like, have a general maybe what you should do in that matchup. Like, be maybe mentally prepared of what the list might look like. I know they usually change because, like, once you, once control lists are out, like, then people know about every single card, so you have to change out a couple cards. Usually, like, try and, like, keep it, like, a little fresh, a little hit more hidden. Um, but I would think about maybe control or more, more Pidgeot control, not Black Lax. Like more like actual Pidgeot control. I think Black Lax just is like whatever at this point. I think Pidgeot control is the better of those two decks for sure. Let's go ahead and uh, very quickly do everyone for that last part, the Pidgeot control versus Block Lax. So Colin, you already gave us yours, right? Are we going to prep for Pidgeot control? Probably not Block Lax. CJ, are you going to test against Pidgeot control or Block Lax? Or neither? I think that Block Lax is actually way too passive right now. I think I really like Pidgeot control because of the uh, attacking options. And the fact that then you just mill you out of resources and then you can't do anything in the late game while they just, you know, take prizes. Uh, I I think that Bogglass has kind of lost its foot because of everyone playing Tarot inside their Charizard list as well. So there's not really much room for Bogglax in the format. And Kayla, between the two, which one are you going to prep for, if any? I think uh, PGL will definitely be more played. I think Block is better, but I think PGL will be more played. All right, again with a bold take, I'm going to have to press you on that one. What makes Block Lax better than Pidgeot Control? Uh, I think that Block has a better Charizard matchup if they're playing, like, Tord style list because you just use Mimikyu over and over again. I feel like as Pidgeot with, bot, like, double boss plus either Palpad or Yell's Cheer, you just have 
so many avenues to take prizes, but as Block, you're just constantly denying them energies to retreat everything. Or Toro, like you'll just run them out of resources in that matchup. And then also, I think the deck is just generally more consistent. Like you have a better time against some of your weirder matchups, like just because the deck's more consistent at finding like Eeries and stuff. And even Temple of Sinnohs against Lugia. Like I think that the Lugia matchup is not terrible for Block Lax, but for Pidgeot Control, it just kind of sucks. CJ, are there any other decks that we have not mentioned yet that you would like to mention? Is this uh, an option for you, me to just talk about a spath, or is this uh, something else completely off the radar? I either of which, whichever you choose. <laughs> All right, we did mention Iron Hands Turbo, and everyone says that like, that deck is a pile. But I've seen some spicy text with that deck. I've actually seen people play it uh, with the TM ter- uh, Crisis Punch. Uh, and that version is actually incredibly scary because you knock out something early with Maridon, you uh, hands maybe their page out for three prizes, and then you just Crisis Punch at the very end for their Zard to take the last two prizes. It's pretty insane. I want to ask our apparently resident Charizard player, <laughs> Caleb, since you tipped your hand, the Charizard questions go to you. Is there a world where iron hands turbo hands is a scary matchup for the charizard player beyond bricking Just ignore that right are there things they can do that actually make you scared of that matchup ever i think the matchup is a lot worse for charizard than it a lot of people make it out to be like i think the matchup is pretty close and i think a lot of it is not bricking related but just the fact that they can handle your draw power like you really don't want to put Pidgeot out unless you're already going far ahead in the matchup. So they can just kind of take your barrel out and then hit you with Iono, and it's kind of annoying. Also, people going away from Max Belt in Charizard is definitely worse in the matchup because you can go for Maridon first, and then they have no way to one-shot an Iron Hands once you've taken one pro- or I guess they have Defiance, but if they take the Maridon out. And a lot of times, as Charizard, without Pidgeot down, I don't have a way to hit the gust immediately, like with the defiance band play. So, and then even if I do that, like I'll take an iron hands out and they just should just go in with Maridon again. Like if they put one psychic energy on Maridon with its own attack, that's like preparing to be gusted. And then they can swing 160 plus whatever their modifiers are and then set up your Charizard for uh, a knockout with iron hands the next turn. So that's like actually the prize mapping if you force them through a Maridon, which is pretty likely they have to gust three times, uh, is not too bad. It's like pretty close to 50-50, and it's usually scary when I'm playing Charizard, but definitely slightly favored for Charizard. And then since we gave uh, CJ and Caleb a chance to mention it, Colin, would you like to say anything about the Iron Hands deck? Um, I think that deck... I, 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 okay, I think the deck is like somewhat kind of a pile at times. However, I do think when it's going, I think it can just kind of want to steamroll. It does have like pretty, like, all, if you put like Lost Box, I feel like that matchup's like pretty solid for you, of course. Like, obviously, you're handsing everything. Um, I like also like a CPAL matchup isn't actually bad at all. Like, you can do well in the Ancient Box. You're hitting all their Ancients for two prizes because of the, the modifiers and crowns and booster capsules and stuff like that. Like, and I guess after your points with the, the Zarg matchup, Caleb, I think like. I think it's not. I thought it was a lot more favored than after before you said that, but it makes a little more sense. So maybe it's not as worse of a as bad of a deck as I write it off to be. So Colin, since you've said you're a CPAL player, you said the hands matchup is isn't that bad. I think is what you said there, or you said pretty. It's like, it's good. like not. It's not that. It's not that good. It's not that good. Like there's things that like you can do. Like they. Like, you can, like, bundle up a two-prize or start a two-prize trade because you don't want to take the... unless you Or you can amp them right on, and then like, you have ways to do that. Um, but if they just go after... Because like, they can just amp your backseat, like, your backscalibers with just two crowns. They can amp it. Your bibber rolls, it kind of gets annoying. But if you can stay ahead in the prize trade, then, like, you're okay. But it's, like, not the best. That deck also does brick a lot. So, like... And I'm not saying CPOW doesn't brick either. I'm not saying that either. <laughs> CPOW is not the most consistent deck in this format, for sure. But... Uh, you can like you can kind of do what you need. To, if you can do what you need to do, and then they don't, then C Power will run over. Probably not, not directly run over, but it'll do a lot better than that deck, I think. So, CJ, any other thoughts on hands after hearing those two, or you kind of co-signing the same? No, I, I think okay. I think uh, it does have the breaking problem. I do think that built-in battle VIP pass for ter- for future 
Pokemon is pretty good. Uh, but other than that, the deck can break a lot. I love Techno Radar as a card. I love Electromagnetic Radar. I love the Techno Radar. It's it's so good. <laughs> Take me back to peak around days. <laughs> good old days. <laughs> the good old days. The radars, man, they're they're pretty solid. Like having your own having your own VIP. I think it's only getting stronger, but getting more future Pokemon, of course, for radar. Yo, shout out to Iron Tyranitar. <laughs> yeah, I, I, Iron Iron Thorn. Thorn. There we Iron go. Thorn. Path to the P. Let's go. Please. I'm so excited for it. It's gonna be so bad, but I'm so excited for that quad Iron Thorns deck. Uh, Caleb, are there any decks we have not mentioned that are on your radar going into Indianapolis? I guess we didn't talk about Gardevoir much. I think it's a deck that'll be a little bit more popular than it has been because it had, it's had some decent placements. A lot of people liked it last format. I think the deck kind of sucks. I don't think <laughs> it's good against Charizard, but I think it has some good matchups. Like I think it's uh, solid against any Arceus deck, Lugia, even Future Hands should be all solid matchups for the fight. I don't even think that the Qian Pao matchup or the Ancient matchup are good for the deck, so I wouldn't play it, but it's definitely a deck that I'm concerned. Like, I just want to know how their deck works, at least play like a couple games against the deck, which I've already done, and then it should be fine no matter what you're playing. I also wanted to add with the the future hands that we were talking about earlier versus Qian Pao, it's one more matchup that the Vacuum could be good in, because you just get rid of their... Uh, Baton. Even even if you are behind, you get rid of the baton, and then they might not be able to follow up. Yo, the two decks in a row that absolutely fold to one singular lost vacuum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ooh, guard of war too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lost, lost vacuum stocks are slowly going up after this episode. All right, get your slowly. gold ones. Buy them all out right now. Gold ones now. <laughs> Play stamp. <laughs> So we have three people who have been oh. successful in this format at least once. Indianapolis is going to have quite a few people who maybe it's their first, second, third regional, right? Because I always forget until I go to a regional and I barely go anymore. Is like there's a lot of people who are still new to this game every single day. So could each of you offer one tip on playing in a regional championship for anyone who maybe they're newer or maybe they just haven't been finding the success or enjoyment that they want from a regional championship? So Colin. Can you go first? What would be one piece of advice you would have to anyone going to Indianapolis or potentially going to Stockholm the next weekend, or etc.? Um, if you're like a first, if this is your very, I would give it like a the two perspective. This is your very first, uh, week, first regional. I would say more importantly, focus on like enjoying the time and enjoying what you're experiencing, kind of taking in the information of how to how to prepare yourself for the next one. Um, because like obviously it can be a little scarier at first when it's your first one because you don't know everyone, you don't know what's going on, like you're still figuring out how to, like to do best of three stuff like that. Um, if you're now, I'll give you the tip if you're trying to do better regionally, if you've gone to multiple and you're still trying to do better, then I would suggest like maybe focus on your, your testing, make sure your testing is good, make sure your list good, like actually have conversations with people about stuff like that, trying to get a better idea before a regional. Um, and I'll give the freed one: make sure you sleep. Make sure you sleep. <laughs> You sleep before the night, so before the regional. Don't test until 3 a.m.? I'm not saying I haven't done that either. But <laughs> CJ, what would be a tip you have for someone for a regional championship? Uh, don't panic switch. That's been a thing that kept me behind a lot last, uh, last season, is that I would see that uh, there's a bunch of people playing X, Y, or Z deck on the tables yesterday, the day before at registration, and then the night before when you're supposed to submit your list, I panic switch to something that counters what I saw on the tables. And then I hit none of them. And then my entire day is ruined because I went 03 drop. Uh, know your list inside and out. Uh, if you can't just quiz yourself and say, I play four Ultra Ball, three Nest Ball, uh, 10 Energy, or something like that, learn your list backwards and forth so you can know what you've, you're missing when your prizes as well. Uh, it's really important to just lock down your list. Uh, Colin could probably say it better than anybody. If you stick to a single deck and stay consistent with it, uh, you will have results that you're going to like. Big facts, big facts. So I want to mention something about what CJ just said about uh, her specifically is I had DM'd you about Aspathra before Orlando Regionals because I've DM'd everyone about Aspathra, right? And I was questioning you about what do you think about this card? What do you think about this card? What do you think about this card? And you had a solid answer for every single card. And if you cannot do that, then you shouldn't be playing that card or potentially even that entire deck. So that is a great thing to do that's going into it either for yourself or if you and your friend are like talking and trying to figure out like what am i playing blah 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 blah. just be like 
why are we playing this? Like, why are we playing this over consistency or why are we playing this over something else? Right. You should have that really good answer. And I really like the way you were able to describe in those DMs just every single thing of like, no, I'm playing this for these specific reasons and I'm pulling it off consistently. You know what I mean? Like all that good stuff is big time tip. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, Caleb, any advice you have for people going into a regional championship? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, and it seems like everyone here is in agreement on this, is just if you can master one deck, then that is the deck that you should just stick with for the whole format, most likely. Just Even if it's like a tier two, tier three, if, as long as it's decently viable and you know it inside and out, you know your list, you know what cards to adapt for certain shifts in the meta, then that'll be the best for you rather than trying to like switch between different decks that you might not know as well. And then one other tip would just be, um, like every tournament, try to get better at one thing. Like if it's note taking or like prize checking or just playing towards uh, making sure that you have time to finish all three games or like scooping at the right moment. Just just try to get better at one thing each tournament, and then eventually you'll be good at everything. We'll go and do some a quick shout out. So shout out any sponsorships and where can people find you if they want more from you? We'll go in that same order. Colin, where can people find you and any shout outs you might have? Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter or X, however you want to call it nowadays, uh, just go to my, just Flynoid, F-L-Y-N-O-I-D. Um, shout out to obviously the, the guys in the kitchen for being awesome and being great homies and 88 Card House for supporting all of our antics that we, uh, we do at these events. So great shout out. CJ, any shout outs and or where can people find you? Uh, if you like memes, follow me on Twitter at the Mermaid. <laughs> I post a lot of PGCG memes there. Uh, shout out to Girl Power. Shout out to my locals in Birmingham, and uh, shout out to my best friend Lexi who made day two with me at Orlando. Can confirm, very good memes that I really wish I would. I wish I had the Twitter game that you have. And uh, <laughs> Caleb, where can people find you? Any shout outs you might have? So if you want to find me, you can find me on Twitter, X, at Memonk, M-E-M-A-A-N-H-C, kind of an interesting name, but uh, there's a little bit of a story there. And then shout out to Charizard for getting me a bunch of money and being the best deck uh, in this format. And then shout out to my parents who support me going to all the tournaments I can. Myself, you can find me on Twitch, Twitter, and YouTube at Mellow underscore Magikarp. Be sure to rate and review the show, share it with people. If you enjoy seeing all these great guests come on and share their thoughts instead of listening to me every single week, then uh, be sure to share the show with as many people because the more we grow, the more cool guests I will be able to get on instead of talking over a microphone to myself. This has been another episode of the Lake of Rage podcast. We'll catch you all next week.